you know, you've argued in your piece, George, that uh, at least on the generative AI piece, right, of the broader set of technologies that AI constitutes, the US is leading, right? Um, I want to ask you to explain on what metrics, on what parameters do you think the US is leading and how are some of the other countries faring uh, on some of those metrics as well? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, first I would say, look, the highest, most important point, this is a global yeah. phenomenon. Um, and while I think Please. the US does have a lead and yeah. played a role in the spawning of this revolution, which I'll talk about, this is a global phenomenon. And what's fascinating is to see how this innovation has spread globally, how different countries and regions have important inputs and things to add to this. Um, so, you know, it, it's definitely a global phenomenon. But I think the reason we argued that at least in the early going, the U.S. is taking a leadership position here is just really, really around the locality of the key inputs to this phenomenon. The intellectual leadership, um, as you well know, the um, the generative AI movement really spawned in 2017 by a paper emerging out of Google. And while that team was very transnational in its character, merged from a U.S. company, you know, a bunch of people operating in, in Silicon Valley. So the intellectual roots of generative AI in many ways um, lie in the United States. Um, second, uh, this, rely, this phenomenon relies on a clearly semiconductor innovation, in particular the work of NVIDIA and, and this, the importance of graphical processing units to enabling this revolution that sort of emerged from, from the U.S chips, chip design, a lot of the intellectual leadership there coming from the U.S. Um, the infrastructure, the the hosts and the infrastructure providers that are allowing these workloads to occur, lar largely dominated by the hyperscalers in the U.S., people like Microsoft and Amazon and Google. Um, and then finally, a lot of the innovation in the application space of this particular node of AI is emerging from the U.S. Now, um, that you know, is in the early going, and I think it's important, and it echoes in some ways the innovation that occurred around the rise of the internet, which very quickly got globalized and unique brands of it got got created um, elsewhere. And I would expect the same thing to happen. And we think there are a number of countries that are and will become more important to this phenomenon over time. One of the ones that we write about most is the US-China competition and how it'll act out here. Um, and my colleague, Jared Cohn, I referenced earlier, has made the observation that, you know, if you look back over time, the U.S. had kind of a 30 year lead over uh, China on techn technology innovation and China largely caught up. In fact, prior to 2017, you might have said that China had stolen the march from the U.S. on AI innovation. And there's a lot of doubt data around the number of research papers emerging from China, the amount of time, energy assets um, around this. This node, which, as I said, you know, has a certain locality to the U.S., I think has reasserted the United States' opportunity to lead in this space. And China labors under some unique limitations in this area. Um, first of all, the nexus of U.S. and China competition has resulted in things like sanctions and export controls and things that have limited their ability to get access to some of the fundamental enabling infrastructure. Second, the amount and character of training data, linguistic training data that's important for these algorithms um, is less of a, you know, the English language corpus of that data is broader than the Chinese language corpus of the data. And the early research was not oriented around Chinese language, you know, training data. So that's been, you know, a hill they, they've had to climb. Um, and then, you know, probably most interestingly, these machines have an emergent and unpredictable quality. And so if you look, China has been a very ardent and early regulator of this technology because, you know, it's, it's super important for them as a country that, you know, social harmony um, and alignment around socialist ideals are paramount to the way that that system works. And so a chatbot which has unpredictable outputs is, you know, somewhat threatening to a regime with that orientation. And their regulatory approach has been to be very focused around the veracity of training data, which is hard to hard to assert and, and validate, and also the consistency of outputs with socialist doctrine. And again, 
given that the systems are emergent, it's hard to guarantee the outputs will be consistent with any given doctrine or orientation. No, that's right. That's right. Of course, you know, just to stay on that uh, U.S. China piece, and I want to come to the U.S. strategy also in a bit. But on the on the, on the question of whether China can catch up here, right? Um, of course, I think the pieces you mentioned are, are valid. But of course, nothing stops the Chinese big tech firms from also crawling the English web and and leveraging that data. Right? Or is there a way that would prevent them from accessing that data? No, and you know, I, I thank you for for raising the, the question in this spirit because um, while we believe the U.S. has an early lead here, China remains a very formidable competitor with enormous intellectual capital, financial capital, and and just clout and throw weight to compete here, and they will. So a few interesting examples of that are, you know, some of the commercial chatbot efforts by folks like um, Baidu are exhibiting, you know, very competitive capabilities with U.S. foundation and global foundational models. Second, you know, I referenced the export control and sanctions challenges to China, in particular getting access to the silicon um, that is the underlying fundamental predicate for a lot of these algorithms. China's made remarkable and surprising progress, um, even in the absence of some of the U.S. originated IP in this area. I think you've written about and talked about the, um, uh, you know, the new Huawei phone, which has um, a silicon created at a seven nanometer geometry, which is surprised the rest of the world at their ability to kind of off ramp from, uh, you know, global standards and build their own silicon at that at that uh, level of sophistication. So. By no means am I counting out China um, in this, and I think they'll again be a formidable ad adversary and, and competitor. Um, and something we can talk about later, you know, China had surpassed the U.S. in their ability to garner training data for certain kind of pre-generative dimensions of AI. So, um, you know, facial recognition data, IoT data, health data, et cetera. Those data sets, while less salient for training large language models in the first instance, may be extremely important in um, using the, allowing those models to create value in those domains. So I think they're going to get paid back for that in the next phases of, of this, this evolution.